Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us in this, in our uh, third webinar uh, titled International uh, Educational Research Partnership. And we are so happy uh, for having Professor Stephen Jack Busson uh, also and uh, uh, Professor uh, Ira in this uh, webinar in order to discuss more in details about uh, how international educational research partnership looks like and what's the challenges and how it would help us to develop our research. Uh, before we start with uh, Professor Stephen, I think it would be better if we introduce this webinar, the idea of this platform with uh, Dr. Rania Sawalhi. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're so lucky, so fortunate to have this third webinar um, as Ibrahim was referring. First of all, we would like to thank all of our um, partners and uh, organizations that we are organizing uh, this series of webinars in collaboration and under the support of, um, and as kind of reference. Um, we're also grateful for Dr. Ira, Prof. Ira, to starting this kind of webinars with us when we had um, several kind of discussions about um, educational research, education leadership research methodologies, how are we defining them, how we can change our practices to have something more practical, more effective, if we continue using those words and those technologies. Um, so we started the first one, we can go, um, Next within the slides, uh, we started those kind of series with having the objectives that we wanted to emphasize. It's a platform. As we always tell, we don't have ready answers and this is not our role. As much as we're trying to share and discuss some of the ideas that um, concerns us and also we want to hear best practices and to see how uh, others had developed and tried. And we also will keep trying to change some of our practices methodologies and our perspectives towards what we are practicing and what we're having. As uh, Ibrahim is sharing that this is our agenda for today, we will be going through what the series, the discussion, and then we will hear lots of insights from our uh, speakers, uh, Prof. Ira and Prof. Uh, Stephen. Um, if you had joined us in the previous two seminars, so the first one we were discussing about international um, partnerships and education and, and leadership research methodologies with uh, Prof. Ayra and Prof. Adnan and Amin. And they shared interesting insights regarding how we might avoid producing the void and reflect on learning towards research and learning towards emphasizing our, um, our practices and reflecting on how we can revisit and improve. The second one was really also interesting with Prof. Anne Lopez and Prof. Ayra when we were reforming and going back and please uh, Prof. Ira, Ibrahim, if you'd like also to share some insights or whoever had joined with us, you can write in the chat is uh, how Prof. Ira and Prof. Anne were trying to um, define their journey of how they work toward decolonizing education research. The second thing, different forms about decolonizing. The third, they gave us very interesting ways of how we can start practicing differently so Prof. Ann was referring if we might have videos about that. Prof. Ira was referring if we change the structure of some of the articles we're having and try to think, is it really helping us in getting new uh, practices and a new ways of understanding and connecting it more to our culture? And one of the more interesting insights were from the last uh, session about how are we really moving towards uh, decolonizing our future? Because if we don't start now, it means that even our future practices would be affected with current decisions that we're taking in our research and in our uh, methods. So how do we run this? Basically, uh, uh, Ibrahim, Abdul Aziz, and uh, myself had met, if you remember, we can go to their slide, Ibrahim. How did we meet? <laughs> Here it is. Uh, first time I met with uh, Dr. Rania Sawalhi, it was at ICSI. International Congress for School Effectiveness and Improvement uh, in 2020, before Corona. We were so lucky in uh, Marrakesh. Uh, um, uh, I'm from Kuwait, Rania from uh, Palestine, Jordan. Living in Qatar. Living in Qatar. <laughs> uh, so we cross our interests. Uh, 
we both work in academia. We love to do research. We are very interested in research and doing research in the Arab region. We acknowledge the gap in the literature in terms of research and publication. And then we become colleagues, we become friends, we have been in touch until Corona hits all of around the world. Then as, as our character, we couldn't uh, 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 sit tight. So uh, we established a number of research and we published uh, around three uh, research in pre-review uh, journals in order to study and uh, understand the situation in MENA region, in Kuwait, Qatar, in uh, Palestine, in uh, Lebanon, and, and in Morocco, uh, to understand this education during the, the pandemic from teacher perspective, from school leadership perspective, also from policy making and politics perspective. We managed to publish the research, and this is this is the idea of being uh, partners and, and having an international partnership. We were five different researchers from five different countries, and then we are going on doing lots of projects here and there in order to just uh, building the platform and, and providing the space for, for uh, colleagues, for researchers, for educators to discuss idea. And it's come now when we met with Ira, Professor Ira, at uh, uh, AERA uh, in Chicago uh, just uh, last April. And then we have this discussion about having numbers of seminars and all of these things, and it's come now with this seminar. So this is how we met. I need also to give you credit, Ibrahim. Uh, first of all, our prayers with our uh, family and friends in Morocco, especially Marrakesh, the city that we had visited before, and our friends also in Libya within these regions and many regions around the world. So Ibrahim, you facilitated lots of within the international kind of partnership, and this is the core of our discussion today, how we can have those kind of different approach and different methods and different ways, which Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Jacobson and uh, Prof. Bogoc would also be sharing with us today. Uh, giving you credit that you facilitated and you were proactive enough, you know, just to come and start approaching and challenging me, let's go, let's share this, let's do this and that. And of course, Abdul Aziz, although he was there, uh, but we started later on when some of our networks crossed and we had a kind of shared and similar interest. Um, from there, this is how we wanted to bring this alive again, as we had benefited from this kind of international contribution, although some might think we're only because of Arabs, but because we have international projects and interests with different uh, platforms. And then we're lucky enough to invite uh, Prof. Jacobson and Prof. Uh, Ira, if we go to uh, Huada, if you'd like to start introducing. So uh, Professor uh, Stephen is a distinguished professor emeritus in the Graduate School of Education at the University of uh, Buffalo, State University of New York. He has served as the GCES Association Deans for Academic Affairs, the Chair of the Department of Education Leadership and Policy, and the Coordinator of ELPS, uh, uh, ELP Educational Administration Programs, his research interests include the reform of school leadership, preparation, and practice, with a particular focus on successful leadership in high, in, in high uh, poverty schools. His most recent work has included examining uh, early childhood education uh, centers in New York and New Zealand, and uh, studying an uh, innovative secondary school in uh, Billis and part training and part training. Uh, with the University of uh, Cap Coast in Ghana to better prepare teachers to become school leaders. At his uh, bio is, the short bio is too long. So we are so happy uh, having you, uh, Professor Steve. And uh, let's start this webinar by asking the, the, the first start question, usually when we talk about uh, having our guests. Uh, can you just start uh, to telling us about your early background and how you come to the idea of being educator and interested in education and also international partnership? Sure. Uh, and first of all, thank you for the invitation. I, I, I really enjoy this opportunity to speak to young scholars or maybe not as young scholars, but folks from around the world to, to, to encourage this kind of interest to crosswalk our different 
forms of education and learn from one another. My personal background is I started my professional career as a teacher in the New York City public school systems in 1970. And I never intended to be a teacher. I was studying psychology and the circumstances of the time the U.S. was involved in a conflict in um, Southeast Asia that I was not particularly uh, supportive of. And there was an opportunity to teach and work in certain schools as an alternative to serving in the military. And I went into teaching and it was one of those things that my career found me. I had no intention to be a teacher and I realized I liked it. And to my surprise, I was pretty good at it. One of the first sort of understandings that I got, Ira will appreciate this having grown up in the same borough of New York as I did, Brooklyn, you assume that the education that you've experienced, the visceral experience you have, is the one everybody's had. But in fact, I grew up in a neighborhood called Canarsie, which is middle class, lower middle class, but predominantly white. And the first place I taught was about five miles away in what's known as East New York, which is predominantly black and Hispanic and high poverty. And it was immediately, um, it was palpable, the difference in what was happening in the schools. Where I grew up, the teachers were part of the community. They shared a lot of values with the students. They enjoyed being with the students. In East New York, the tension between teachers, community, and students was, was so sharp, so clear, that it was obvious to me that even though I was involved, I had experienced supposedly the same educational system, there was no way these children could be successful given the terms that were being presented to them. Even so far as being told by teachers regularly, you have to get a good education to get out of this place. In other words, where you live, where your family is, is not a place to be. Nobody would want to be there. How disrespectful is that to students? And it, it, it sort of struck me that this something is wrong here, but I was not sophisticated at that point in time. I didn't know or understand aspects of structural racism and how that was playing out in the very system that I grew up in, and it seemed to have done a, a good job educating me. Let me fast forward a little bit. Uh, after teaching for a while, I realized that I wanted to be at the table when decisions were made. And what that meant is becoming certified as a school leader, as a school administrator. And I went to get prepared. And, and to be quite honest, the preparation was terrible. It had nothing to do with forward thinking. It had nothing to do with making critical judgments about what was going on. It was simply following rules understanding the traditions and just adhering to them without a lot of respect for the culture of the community. It was, it was like living in two separate worlds. And teachers who were taking this preparation at the particular place I was going to really had no interest in school leadership. They were doing this in order to increase their salary, full stop. So I was encouraged uh, by the program coordinator. He said, Steve, you think different than some of these folks. You ought to go to graduate school for a doctorate. And he was right. I wound up at Cornell and my career path changed very quickly. I realized my work, what really excited me was the study of the schools, not the life in them all the time. I was not, I'm not hardwired to do it that way. I, I just operate on a different function in a different manner. And that led me eventually to University of Buffalo. And 35 years later, I re retired two years ago, had a wonderful career there. But during that point in time, I had these opportunities to create international connections. And let me, let me sort of fill in a little bit of the gap. I got funding, I received funding from the Wallace Foundation to look at leadership in high poverty schools that was producing results that one would not have anticipated 
given the demographics of the student body. It's sort of a, a, a an outgrowth of the effect of schools literature. And if you're without going into detail about it, that quadrant of outliers, that schools where the demographics suggest that children won't do well, well, there was always a cluster of schools where they exceeded expectations. And, you know, the curiosity is, why? How is this happening? And so I wanted to delve deeper into that. And I began, and it was a study at that point, I, th I think we started with six schools, we wrote about three that were the exemplars of this. Simultaneous to that, there was some activities going on, uh, some international scholars were meeting in Nottingham, led by Christopher Day, Ken Leithwood, um, David Gurr. I think there were six nations involved, Joram uh, Mueller from um, Norway, Olaf Johansson from Sweden. They were trying to put a team in the, the United States as well. The person who was supposed to lead that team took ill. I got a call from Ken. He said, Ken said, Steve, why don't you create the American team. You start with your studies that you're already working on with funding from Wallace, and we will go from there. And that's where it began. I mean, I I had a natural, um, I, I would say an innate curiosity about cultures outside of my own. And this gave me an opportunity to meet regularly with these scholars. And that network has expanded and um it's called the International um, School Successful School Principalship Project. And it's still in existence. You can go to the website, ISSPP. It's uh, housed, the website is housed at Oslo, University of Oslo. I think there's about 22 nations that are involved in it. And it's just, it's just been a wonderful, it was a good jumping off point for me but it also um, created other international opportunities. So let me let me stop at that point. That, that's sort of bringing it up to about where we are now. I'm I'm mute. Sorry, I'm mute. Yeah. Just just the question is uh, how you become passionate on international partnership. This is the most uh, important thing because as 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 educators as researchers sometimes including or to be involved in some international project may be facing some challenges in 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 term of uh, for example capacity language traveling and mm -hmm. all these stuff sure let me let me let me start with the first part of it which is the interest in, and as i said before i had sort of an innate curiosity about this but there was also something, I wouldn't say it's peculiar to the American system, but it is an aspect of the American system that helped to push me outside of it. And that is that we do governance at the state level, as opposed to the national level. Education, law, and policy is promulgated state by state, even though it looks very similar. There are marked differences from state to state. So for example, my state of New York would not tolerate some of the policies being promulgated in Ira's state of Florida. And I, I would imagine the converse would hold true. Yet schools look very much the same place to place. As a consequence of having 50 systems of governance, American scholars often get sort of caught up in their own value system that we just have to study ourselves and with 50 experiments going on, we'll figure out the best way. And because our journals and because the field is really dominated by English language speakers, the knowledge is compressed into the English language world and the developed world. And it's terribly limited because of that. And I kind of... And I, again, I, I can't explain why, other than the fact that it just seemed a sense of hubris that, you know, when you travel abroad, one of the things that happens is you're essentially holding up a mirror to yourself. You see things new, but you always see things in light of that newness, which helps to explain who you are. 
And as I began to travel and to see how education was being structured in other countries, it just gave me wonderful insights, some of which suggested that maybe the way we were doing it in the U.S. was not the best or only way to do it. And sometimes the way we were doing it in the U.S. was actually very smart, but it fit within our context. And this became a very important aspect of it, recognizing how context-specific education is. We organize our schools in relation to our national culture, our religious beliefs, our ethnic beliefs, and we build out from there. And it becomes kind of a curiosity as to why these differences emerge. And I could offer several different examples, but just, just a couple. I mean, one was looking up at Canada, a northern neighbor, where I live in Buffalo. We're a half an hour away from Canada. I mean, to, to paraphrase one of our past candidates, you can see Canada from here, okay? Um, in Canadian culture, in Canadian educational uh, governance, they don't have a hard line between church and state. So in the province of Ontario, religious schools are funded by the state. That would not happen in the U.S. So you have a whole system of schools that have a particular orientation or a variety of orientations being run on the public purse. That could not happen in the U.S. I went to a meeting with, and I took some of my doctoral students up in northern Sweden, in Omea. It was... Um, at the university there. And one of the things that was very nice is built into the conference was visit to schools. And we went to an early childhood center and it was a beautiful spring day. And out in front of the school, there were baby carriages and there were babies taking a nap. And there was no adult, just, just a line of cribs and strollers and babies sleeping. My two students who were both principals lost it. They could not understand how could you leave the babies out there like that? And when they asked the people inside, they said, what, what, are, you, what are you afraid of? Nobody's going to take our babies. These are our babies. And yet in the U.S., you would never do that. The, the level of litigation would prevent that. I could go on and on with a lot of different examples that emerged, but it was, it was seeing those differences that just each time it happened, it was, this, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. This needs to be pursued. Now, let me, let me get, there was a question embedded there about the difficulty of doing this research. And I think that the greatest difficulty really is one of finances and expenditures. The way ISSPP worked through that, which was quite brilliant because we that program has never had funding for the entire project, was never able to do that. Each little group often found some funding. But the way we were able to leverage the connections was using conferences as a point of meeting and presenting. And I don't know who came up with it, but it was really quite brilliant because I'm sure it's the same for most of you. To be able to attend a conference, you need to get on the program. Then you can get some funding to go, okay? When you have, and, and most of you know this reality, some conferences are difficult and are very competitive, and some, all you have to do is send in a proposal. Well, it didn't really make a difference to us. We thought that if we continue to apply, we would be able to have our sessions, we would get there early enough to meet, and we would plot out where we would meet again next year. And then we would begin to plot out, okay, how do we now begin to crosswalk our work, not only in individual articles, but co-authored articles, and then begin to reach out to journals to do special issues focused on this subject. And I have to tell you, special issues are very often something that editors want, particularly if the authors have global reach, because you can sell issues. I mean, there, there is, there is a, a, a sense of one hand scratches the other's back. 
you work together on that. Some of the national teams, like in Sweden, they were able to get money. Norway, they were able to get money from the public purse. We couldn't do that in the U.S. Uh, after the Wallace money dried out, and then we were sort of on our own. That's probably the biggest challenge, but it's 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 not that hard to overcome. See, uh, I think, see, uh, the conferences is very good opportunity. And uh, uh, Rania and I, also Ira, we met all of, all of, all, every time we met at conferences. But the question is, not many have fun to travel. So what, uh, to create opportunities, what is your unique uh, uh, experience or uh, method in order to get funds from such institutes or university, for example? Well, as I said, I mean, I, I, I don't know your specific institution. So so very often, if you have an invitation to a conference, you will get some funding. But that said, when we were doing this, it was all pre-Zoom. I mean, this is this is what we're doing right now takes away a lot of that expenditure. And you could perhaps create your own opportunities using just what you're doing today, exactly what you're doing today to the point where you can build enough gravitas, if you will, where you then make the proposal to an AERA and you're you're on the map. They begin to look at you more seriously. But you know, I I can't I cannot speak to the politics and the dynam and the dynamics of different institutions. I knew it my own. I had a set aside of a certain amount of money that I could use for travel. I used to use that to go to these meetings first and foremost, because I knew I was getting more than just the conference meeting out of it. I was getting this network. And building the network, it takes time, but it's it's the most powerful piece of it. Because within the network, you have people who have access to journals, to, to publications, to ways that you can disseminate your work. And the more you begin to disseminate, the more you get read, the more leverage you have going forward. Ayala? So what, what I find so interesting is, I mean, your background and how you moved into international work from a local context, Brooklyn, and then expanded to looking outward, you made that a theme when you were the president of UCEA, you made that a theme. And, and yet, and I think maybe you've addressed it, but I, I'd like to hear more. You continue to look outward, but even institutionally, we can't get past five to 10% international participation at some of these very large conferences. So even if we use the word international, it's, it's a very small group. Um, and if I can piggyback one, one piece that I see that others don't seem to capture as well as you do, um, you once wrote about the Dalai Lama coming to Buffalo and listening to that speech. Well, today in 2023, we're all listening to speeches being made by Pope Francis about how countries should be open, how migrants are human beings, um, there's something that has moved you professionally and personally that still represents a barrier to others in ed leadership specifically. Can you, can you make sense of my rambling? Uh, it, it's not easy, Ira, but I will try. Uh, let me let me just give you experience from UCEA when I began to try to push towards international work. At the time, I, I, before president, I served two, two three-year terms on the executive committee. 
So I went through a lot of the important changes that UCA went through at that point in time. And a lot of it was very important work about social justice. And when I was bringing up issues of international work, I was getting pushback that this had nothing to do with issues of social justice. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, when, when you begin to look more globally, you recognize that this is a problem across the board. But then the pushback was, okay, if we go your route, that's energy taken away from what it is we can do here. And shouldn't we be taking care of American schools first? Uh, and, and my feeling was there didn't have to be that priority. It didn't have to be a zero sum game. We could do both. We were, we being UCA, were a large enough community that you could have scholars whose intention and focus was specifically on the U.S. And that's what I was talking about earlier, that there's sort of a, an insulation. We're so big. We do things so well that why do we need to look outside? And once having been outside, you realize, well, that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. There are a lot of lessons to be learned. You know, one of the sessions I organized when I was in that role of uh, associate director for international perspectives, we did we did a session on indigenous leadership. Talk about voices that never get heard. And with an indigenous leadership, the first lesson I learned is just what we did on this session. The first thing you do is you introduce yourself. You place yourself in the context of the conversation. Western scholars tend to jump right to the conversation as if they are free and avoiding everything that surrounds their own biography, who we are, what it is we bring to the table, what it is we are that then resonates with people we meet outside and how they look at us, how we look at them. And now how do we begin to mediate and negotiate and share. <laughs> I mean, just share. That's that's really what it's about. So it, it's very hard for me to put myself into someone, somebody who's reluctant to do this. I, I don't understand why they would be reluctant, but some people are, and I would have to leave it at that. Other than the 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 international study of successful principles, do you have other examples of how to move people from that either or, which is a zero sum game, to an and both, we can do it all. Oh yeah. Kind of my mindset, do you have other examples that you could offer? Well, I, I could just share how I brought my colleagues in from the University of Buffalo. Okay. So when when we first joined, when I essentially I first joined ISSPP, I turned to my junior colleagues and I said, here's a wonderful opportunity. They were already doing work, domestic work, work in the U.S. But I said, you know, a lot of that work, you're still going to do that work, but you're now going to bring it to an international audience and begin to see how how schools in the U.S. compared to schools in China, compared to schools in Denmark, will have those conversations. And it was people like Ira would know these folks. The rest you may not know, but I, you might. I mean, Rose Yellamaki, Laurie Johnson. Then, then going beyond, we went to other groups. I, I, I approached other universities. University of Texas at San Antonio. That team, Gary, Gary Crow at Indiana. And a lot of these folks were genuinely interested in doing this because they realized it didn't take them away from the work that they were doing at home. They could still let, do that work, broaden it by bringing it to international audiences, and then even more excitingly, bringing international scholars to the U.S. Where you now, I'll give you I'll give you an example where I did it at UCA when I was president. One of the things you have as president is you have the opportunity to name a keynote speaker. I brought in a gentleman named Jonathan Jansen from South Africa. 
I think Jonathan gave one of the best speeches ever. This was a man who was engaged in South African battles about apartheid in the era of Nelson Mandela and New Mandela. I mean, it, it was brilliant. And for all those folks who were talking about social justice in the U.S., after the speech, some of them who were very reluctant to buy my line came over and said, I get it now. I was so glad to hear him speak because it was so authentic. And it was, there, there is no difference. We're talking about the same issues. In fact, that was a more severe issue. And yet I can understand it. So, you know, I, I use the term, I, I think those who are not comfortable with it see it as zero sum. I think those of us who get into it recognize it's and both. Sure, why not? Uh, uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think when it's come to international partnership, it's it's most uh, most it's an it's a human aspect. So uh, one of the questions that come to my mind is the idea of what are the challenges that the researcher might face in joining these partnerships, especially when it's come to the human aspects from different language, from different context, from different background. So what are the challenges and how he advise uh, as a researcher to avoid these challenges? Yeah, I, well, I don't know that you can avoid the challenges. I think those challenges, the, the ones you've given are there. I mean, language, culture, they're there. Um, and again, some of these things, I, I don't know that you can really train people to do it. I think it's somewhat innate. If you enjoy sharing ideas with other people, have just this curiosity about the way things are done, and you find people in other locations who have that similar interest, you hit it off right away. I mean, it's not that complicated. On the other hand, the people who are reluctant, you're probably not going to meet them anyway. So you have to slowly build those contacts. You know, one of the questions you would pose, what is a partnership, an international partnership? I think it's any time two or more people begin to have these kinds of conversations, you're at the developmental stage of a partnership. What you're suggesting, though, is what is the more robust forms of part? It takes time. They're, they're, they're one of the things that's a little bit difficult, particularly in an academic career, one that cherishes tenure and going up for promotion in certain periods of time is wanting to get to this quickly. There's no, there's really no shortcuts. You know, it's, it's going to build slowly. It is going to build as you quite rightly say on the relationships that you build, finding a couple of like-minded scholars from a few other places, people that you enjoy writing with. I mean, writing, writing is a, is a different, is a struggle. I find it a very personal and solitary activity, but I do enjoy writing with international scholars, perhaps more so than with my American colleagues, because some of that is becomes piecemeal. This is really, you have to push the boundaries. Okay, when you said that, I don't understand what you mean, because that term, and I, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example, means something different in the US. And you're using that term. Uh, I can give an example. When I first was in the field, I went to a meeting in um, Manchester. And they were talking about educational management. And they were using that as being exactly the same as administration. In my mind, management is different than administering. But the field eventually evolved that we now use the term leadership. So it, 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 there needed to be, I needed to have conversations with people. How are we, how are you using that term? Which to me means uh, management means sort of a, a discourse we, where the rules are set and you just follow the rules. Where leadership is a little bit more free flowing. I, I, I can give you another example. I did, a, I did a presentation in Germany and we were talking about leadership, educational leadership. And my conception of leadership allows for a little bit of anarchy. I'm not, I'm not upset 
when school principals deviate from the rules or bend them a little bit because the context of the community requires it. In Germany, leadership is following the rules very strictly. That's that's their context. I'm not going to argue with that. But we had to we had to begin to take apart the language to understand why we were not communicating initially. Uh, Rami, I think you have an uh, interesting question. Oh, trust me, I have. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for. Um, I know it's kind of a very interesting examples that you had shared with us, but I have a list of things, and we'll start with uh, with what you were referring to and how you find it kind of easier when you work with international colleagues than you work with people from the same state or United States in general. And that would guide me for a question. When do we call this as an international collaboration? Because sometimes if I'm working with a colleague from, let's say, different country, but I'm following their same approach, their same, same way of thinking, I'm just another name on the list. Is this kind of an international collaboration or partnership? or just an extra um, research group that has uh, different people or different backgrounds. So this is something for me is kind of interesting. Just allow me to, to connect them and then you you mm -hmm. might just mix okay. them or blend them when you answer my, my comments. Uh, the second thing is about your headship. You know, you had this different opportunities as you call them, um, or I might call them kind of gatekeepers. So you had those committees or you had those positions or you had uh, being in a journal. So what what did you try to um, reinforce or to open or to provide within those opportunities, not only as a, as a contribution from your side, but also to empower or enable or to um, show these kinds of things that people, yes, really they can partner, they can think about it differently. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot in there. Um, let me let me um, try to take the first part, which essentially, how do you define these partnerships? And, and my answer to your question would be yes, it is a partnership, an international partnership. If you're coming from two different governance structures, even though they may be very similar. OK, so that and in fact, with ISSPP, what made it successful over time was that we were using a common protocol for all the studies. So whether you were doing the study on leadership in the US or you were doing it in India, you were asking similar types of questions. So the, the, the protocols, by standardizing the protocols, you had some commonality which enabled you to crosswalk a bit. I don't know the specifics of the of the states you're talking about. It could be that the governance structures are so similar as to seem to be the same. And yet, I would imagine because they have two governance boundaries, there are some unique differences one to the other. And the conversation begins to draw that out, where the differences exist where it is that your uh, maybe your religious beliefs have led to a certain way of governing, your cultural beliefs have led to a certain way of governing, you know, the disparities in income and wealth in your country lead to different ways of governing. I apologize, I forgot the second part of the question. So I was talking about the opportunities or the headships or the different roles that you had. How did you oh, oh, oh. try to support others? Thank you. Um, you just go for it. I mean, there is there, you know, I mean, I, I would say I was ambitious, but not overly so. Uh, I, I, as I said earlier, with my own desire as an, as an educator, as a teacher, I haven't I have respect for my opinions. I don't feel that my opinion has to be the prevailing opinion, but I like to have a seat at the table. So any organization that I've chosen to commit time to, I like to sit down with the people who are making the decisions to at least have some influence about where we're headed. And if it really doesn't seem like we're headed in a direction that makes sense, I can, I can step away. 
but I like, you know, but that's me, you know, and I can't, I can't put that into somebody, but the fact you're, you folks are at the table suggests to me that you have a similar kind of desire. You know, you want to create something, you want to be involved in that creation, and you're not afraid to expend time and energy to do it. And you have to have thick enough skin that when people say, no, we're not going to do it, sometimes sometimes you lose. You know, sometimes you don't get your way. That's all right. Ira, I see Ira has a hand up there. Yeah, Ira shouldn't raise your hand. Ira, you're part of this. And I would also challenge you because we were discussing uh, why we're preparing kind of... Um, but yeah, just go ahead and then I will ask my question. Go ahead, Dwayne. I would I would add to your question, Rania, because because Dr. Jacobson for many years has been a journal editor. So I would add the role of editor to the question and and then and then push it. So so here's the context, Steve. I continue to get rejections from journals when I step outside of the format and or I step outside of the genre. Mm -hmm. Okay, those two things, um, the the socialization of, re of reviewers and the socialization of the journal is such that when they see a genre or a format they weren't expecting at that particular moment in time, then that becomes uh, a negative. As a journal editor, if we wanted to bring leadership, however you define leadership, if we wanted to define bring leadership into the editorial role, how might publishing begin to evolve in, in an exciting, democratic, um, inclusive way that it doesn't seem to be evolving in the field of ed leadership? For me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I, I'm glad you bring up the idea. First of all, being a journal editor is not something that everybody's cut out to do. And it was one of those things that was offered to me, and I wound up liking it. More specifically to your question about the pieces that come in, the drafts that come in and, and don't fit the tight mold. There's a few ways that at LPS we try to deal with that. Initially, what I tried to do was to create an editorial review board that was more representative than just the United States, perhaps the United States and Canada, to broaden it and bring in bring in reviewers from around the world so that there was an opportunity to expand that. The other thing, uh, and part of it was a response um, to a critique that Phil Hallinger had done a couple of years ago which was in looking at the major journals, you know, he said, look, we're still um, giving preference to a traditional Western overview. We're not open to other ideas. A lot of times with a journal, you're getting a lot of manuscripts. I mean, LPS, we get a lot of manuscripts. And, to, uh, and I'm sorry to say very often what you're trying to do is perhaps do desk rejects to reduce the amount of paper flow to reviewers because you could just lean on reviewers so much. And I know the, it, it's really bogging down. That said, occasionally a piece will come in and it's structurally it needs work and grammatically it needs work. But substantively, this is interesting. This is really interesting. So as an editor, you've got to make that commitment that we're going to try to see this work through to success. But that's not easy. It, it you know, and and I don't, I don't, um, I think we could have done better at LPS. I think I'm, I'm not the editor there anymore. I think it still can do better. 
but it's it is very hard it's very hard when you're walking across language and also recognizing how slowly the literature base expands so in other words you'll sometimes get a piece in from a country let's say in africa and it's an interesting article but there's nothing new in terms of the literature that's already been developed in the developed nations but that said what i would always try to argue but we have a new context this work is being applied in a place where it's never been applied before so why not take the chance why not open it up to an examination of this kind of motivation theory for example in malawi why not i mean it, it, it's it's applicable there may not be anything new, but it might confirm and support what we found in Georgia. So why not take a look at it? So there, there has been criticism of journals because of that. There are, I guess there is also the opportunity of the creation of new journals that are more open and forthcoming with it. But um, that's, that's, I guess, my quick answer to that. Not so quick, but trying to redress that somewhat. I appreciate that, you know. Um, <laughs> I think I think now it would be better, the good time to open the floor for the audience. So if you have uh, questions, you can either write it on the chat or raise your hand and uh, open your mic to ask uh, the question. So uh, I can think my start? staff... Yeah, with, can we start with Dr. Maisa's question because she's about to leave about the outcomes? Yes, please, Maisa. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, everybody, for a great conversation. I I just was wondering about the you know um, tangible outcomes of the international partnerships that uh, Dr. Jacobson has engaged in, uh, whether like its influence on here in the US or in the other international partner uh, country? Well, what I, what I would suggest you do if you want to see tangible outcomes in a remarkable way, go to the website, the ISPP website. They have a listing of all the publications and not only have there been books and journal articles, but there have been a considerable number of dissertations and master's theses that have been written as well. And it's been grooming. I mean, and that's been very important, having students who you recognize, you know, um, you might you might have, a, a you know, 10 students, but one or two of those students has a genuine interest in international work or they're an international student. I've always tried to invite them in. And, you know, to be able to use the protocols of ISSPP or similar type protocols to guide the research, it's qualitative, it's a lot of interview uh, analysis, and to use that to guide their dissertations. Then you have another generation of researchers, and that's always important for this kind of sustainability, to be able to build that capacity going forward. I, I, you know, I mean, that's going to vary from institution to institution. You know, some institutions have a large international body and a focus on that. Some are more domestic and they won't. But that's, that's, um, ISSPP can at least give you an idea of how um, creative and voluminous this work can be over the course of, it's been over 20 years now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, are there any uh, examples of how the research was bridged into practice? Um, I, I've, I've quickly glanced at the website and it's really very impressive and I have it now saved on my desktop so so I can access it easily. Uh, I was just wondering, has, has any of these efforts ever been um, extended into field work in schools or like uh, yeah, I, I, I can't give you a specific example but what I can say is when the IS as I told you what we were doing in the early years is we were sort of a movable feast we would present at AERA and UCA and ICSI and EERA wherever there was a conference we had a group of folks that would show up 
and I think it was at AERA in San Francisco, I just threw it out there on a lock. I said, why don't we run our own conference? We seem to be, you know, able to generate this interest. And Chris Day picked up on it right away. And he said, you know what? I'm going to go back to University of Nottingham and see what we can do. And now ISSPP has a conference, I think about every second or third year that they run themselves. And it's a practitioner conference. So it's got academics, but wherever it's held, they bring in school leaders and they take the whole conference out to the schools. So there are visitations and those are absolutely wonderful because that's that, you know, for me, I, I don't work in schools. I study schools, but to actually feel that experience of being in a school other than the ones I'm used to and seeing some ideas, I can give you a quick example. And it's just in Sweden, we went to a K-12 school. It was a fairly large school. In the U.S., we have gotten into this governance structure. We have elementary, you have middle school, high school. Some reason we feel like kids have to be separated, which has far more to do with the management of students than anything that's good for them developmentally. Went to Sweden and watched this. And I remember walking around. There was a break. And there were a couple of boys, teenage boys, and they were roughhousing. They were wrestling. And the principal just walked right past. And I thought, this is great. Because in the U.S., oh, no, 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 stop it. Got to stop fighting. That's what boys do. They're going to do, if they don't do it during school time, they're going to do it after school time. They're going to do it. So why not just let them do it in a way? And you can see this was just roughhousing for fun. These kids liked each other, but that's the way they played. And the principal got it. And there was no problem that the little kids were watching the big kids do it because it didn't really change their behavior. So, I mean, to, to your answer, there have been, I don't know that it's been formalized. I don't know that I could tell you that if you go to this country, you could see this practice that was instituted. I would not be surprised if that's not the case, though. But I can't, I can't give you a definitive answer. Thank you. Um, interesting. If you just allow me for a quick comment, I think while we were preparing for this um, for this session, Jacobson and, and Bogut, you were also referring. Sometimes we just tend to quantify the outcomes, and we say this is the number of research we want. While we will be focusing more sometimes on the um, implications, or maybe the quality, or even just addressing a new concept, it might be an outcome by itself, like something we really want to celebrate. And as part of the network that you were you were referring to is, uh, I know one of the meetings I attended, they were having collaboration with Bilmas, they were having collaboration with other organizations. So that might be an outcome by itself. It's not only to uh, to produce something. Maybe in our case, uh, we will find having this online meeting as an outcome or something that we're really happy to have this platform while others wouldn't consider it as a, 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 a productive, way of meeting or networking. So sometimes providing this space for innovative practices or for different formats, regardless of how we see it or um, sometimes how we judge it, if we will use this word or how we evaluate it, just to make sure that we're having this flexible place. And please elaborate on that, um, Ira, if you like. Yeah, you, have to expand, you have to expand your understanding of what a productive outcome is. It's not just a journal article. It's not just a book chapter. Sometimes it's a subtle change in behavior. So I, I referenced this notion of indigenous leadership. Ever since I heard the gentleman that we brought, his name was Chris Sarah. He was from Australia. He was, he was an Aboriginal person. And he began the session by talking about where he was born on a river in the outback to help understand who he was. I I wasn't born on a river in the outback, but when I do presentations now, I usually take a couple of minutes to try to provide that biographical background to give some context to the listener of how my ideas were formed. That was a very productive outcome for me, full stop. If it has helped my presentations, and help the listener who listens to me 
grasp and understand what I'm saying, then it's even better. So we, we can get easily caught up in looking at CVs and counting. It's the impact can be very different and, and, and perhaps measured in different ways. I, I apologize if my question was perceived as uh, evaluated in any form. I'm just always no. very concerned about bridging uh, theory and practice. That's that's always on my mind is uh, I worry about the uh, the divide and the separation where uh, sometimes practitioners feel that uh, scholars are, you, you know, um, removed from them mm -hmm. and really don't care about what happens in their classrooms and their schools. And is, so that's why I, so that's why I'm bridging, bridging uh, research and practice is always mm -hmm. uh, on my mind. That's why, that's hence the question. Yeah, it, no, it was, fair enough. That I think Steve's answer of having listened to the keynote so the first thing is just the listening as a meaningful activity, maybe even that as an accomplishment, but then incorporating it. And, and it was really interesting when we, when we go back and play back this YouTube and Steve introduces himself, what he didn't say is... I learned this technique from an indigenous uh, speaker who I heard in whatever year. He just jumped right in. It became Steve. It became who he is. Um, but as long as accomplishments have to be documented on the CV, as long as we have incentives that are tied to concrete things, where we're in many ways hurting the notion of what I think Steve's been talking about, openness and curiosity and loving of learning of something new. Every which way you turn at the university, the opposite message is given to our young colleagues. And... Um, and I think it's important that somehow people like Steve Jacobson and others um, pass that wisdom on to the next generation, which is not another publication, which is not another chapter or a journal article. Um, but that's really, that's really calling into question what we currently do. And, and somehow we've got to make that, those behaviors um, part of the academy. You I, know, I, it, it raises a funny anecdote. That same UCA conference where we had indigenous leadership, there was a woman named Rosemary Campbell, who is a Jamaican woman. Uh, and we, we were sitting at lunch and, and people were coming around saying hello. And when they left, she said, you know, you're an elder. And first, I didn't know what she, she was meaning by that. I said, oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm getting on in years. She said, no, 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 no. The way people treat you is you've got the wisdom of an elder. And I realized it was a really wonderful compliment, but it's an understanding of how we look at people in the academy. I mean, we look at people by their titles and the credentials, but we should also be looking at just the basic wisdom that they have to share and how they do it. And I, I, I was so flattered when I realized that that was the intent, but it's something that, you know, I mean, Ira is viewed as an elder as well, and it's not just age, it's recognizing that as a community, we have history, and we have some people who have absorbed a lot and can share a lot. And their willingness to share is what you seek out. Interesting. I know Ibrahim would be uh, sharing Tahani's question, but I also wanted to share another aspect of outcomes. 
because you were referring to conferences and I mentioned this when we were preparing for the session, I said, when I first went to UCEA or any other conferences, but this example from UCEA, and Frank Kushana, an ex-president for UCA came to me and she said, this is your first time. I would make sure that you are introduced to other colleagues and you have this kind of networking, et cetera. For me, that was an outcome. For me, that was kind of an um, enlightening way of how to welcome people, how to connect with them, how to have this international partnership in different format. I'm not writing research. I hope I would write research with Frank Kushan. But at the moment, I just remember her personal touch and the way that she welcomed me while I was just as my first time, and mm -hmm. I don't know much about you know what's happening within this. Another funny outcome you might consider it. One of my colleagues just gave me a bluebird, happiness bluebird, which I uh, have it in in my car, and I continuously remember our conversation just as as of, of this simple outcomes. So if we're talking about this kind of human touch and humanizing the process of international partnerships. It's way beyond that. It's sharing cultures, sharing concepts, it's sharing those opportunities of discussion and knowing about what's happening in different contexts, which I wouldn't be able to know by my own if I just focus on my own thoughts without really listening and observing what's happening. So I think that would be a nice um, transfer to Tahani's question, Ibrahim, if you just go because and connecting yes, to how we also met. <laughs> Exactly. Tahani question is most about it's more about uh, uh, what do you suggest uh, uh, methods or strategies to find out uh, potential collaborator who expert complements uh, uh, our interest other than conference uh, conferences network. The problem is uh, uh, not most of educators or researchers, especially in the Middle East, uh, in certain region, could have a fund to attend these uh, conferences. So what do you suggest uh, as an alternative way to, uh, to find these uh, 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 collaborator and international, to, to join these international network? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is find something that a few of you agree upon as an area that you want to research together. Some common interest. I mean, it could be the, the, the construction of international networks, and maybe that's it. We had, we, when I'm, when I'm referring back to ISSPP, were just some folks who were originally not connected to one another, had a common interest of this idea of what defines a successful school leader. And then how is that definition uh, realized in different contexts? And what are the similarities and what are the differences? But there's got to be some kind of common interest that you want to share your research, your research, their research, work together on research to get answers to it. And, and I can't define that for you. I mean, that, that's not something I can do. I, I can only give you, you know, the things that we found that worked for us and maybe they will or they won't for you. I don't know, you know, other mechanisms to leverage those kind of resources at your home institutions. You know, maybe there is a funding agency that you can turn to to get you started. But even before you go out for funding, because so very often I see people chase dollars and they will take on projects that they don't really have interest in, except for the fact that it's going to be supported. That is all wrong. Better to do research on your own dime, if it really drives you, than to do it on someone else's dime. I mean, uh, as an example, I saw this, I was involved in some partnerships in Africa, and a lot of the scholars there chase money because it's the only way they can get funding for research, the only way they can get publications to get promoted. It's a terrible cycle, a very destructive cycle. So after the course of time, they never, they never develop their own voice. They're always doing somebody else's work. As opposed to the luxury I guess I had, and I can't say that other people have it, I was very fortunate that I knew an area that I'd wanted to know more about. And for one reason or another, I was able to get first some support through Wallace and then also the camaraderie through 
this international group. We're suddenly finding scholars in so many places who had this similar kind of interest. Why do these schools do well? And what role does the did the principal or does the principal play in making that happen? It's not complicated as a question, very complicated to tease out the answers. I think if you can, uh, if you if you might uh, allow me to add, one of the strategies or one of the methods that you can find these international or collaborators, I think in social media, if uh, Rania can agree with me on it, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram is now an, a very nice and good uh, platform to meet new people, to connect with them. Uh, also, ResearchGate is one of the good uh good uh, platforms that you can find exactly your topic, who wrote about it, from where they wrote about it. So these uh, these social media platforms, it could be the starting point in order to find uh, these peoples. Yeah, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm from a generation that preceded that. So I've never gotten terribly comfortable with social media and to some extent more concerned about what people come to know about me that should be none of their business because of social media. But I think you're right. I think like Zoom, I, I mentioned that before, I think there is something that can be developed from using a platform like this where you can connect and it's not going to be breaking your budget. It's built into the institutional hard wiring nowadays where you can actually utilize it and then perhaps springboard from that into these other things we were talking about. I mean, as soon as soon as this Zoom meeting gets posted on YouTube, we begin to see what kind of reaction, if any, we get. And that opens up all sorts of people who are interested in what just happened this last hour and 15 minutes, um, they become potential partners in some kind of project. But you have to be open to it. But I think Steve is absolutely right. This Zoom, YouTube, anything we do um, is a potential reaching out um, and putting out. So I think what was really wonderful, I, I Steve, I I just want to say, um, you were you were magnificent today. Oh, well, thank you. In the sense of sharing your whole self. I mean, so we didn't just get Steve the scholar, right? We got Steve the human being with a curious. Um, intellectual person who cares about ed leadership and i know i learned a lot um and i hope other people will when they listen to this uh, zoom recording so thank you thank you thank you and thank you know you and just, just as, uh, one last thing it, it, it just uh, another site uh ira you know paula cogero Yes, and yes. Paula has a posting, a place where she invites just brief responses. And I put one up on there and, my, you know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I got so many positive reviews from people saying, can tell me more about where I, I think I was, I think I was talking about Belize, about the school that I studied in Belize. And people were just fascinated. So sometimes th that willingness to put it out there, yes. you don't know where it's going to land and who it's going to touch. And sometimes it, it, it hits people just the right time, right place where they say, I want to know more about that. Yeah. So, Rania, you should look up Paula Cordera. It's Global Leadership. There you go, right. Global Leadership Fellowship or something like that. Um, but just like Steve, it comes out of her passion. Mm-hmm to do really good international work. And it's been her life's work. And somebody you'd probably want to have on one of these meetings. She's terrific. She, she is. That's, that's a great idea. 
So you started with thanking, um, and we also would like to thank you both, and I'm sure Ibrahim also, as we are trying to conclude within the next eight, 10 minutes. And just the the generosity from Ireland, you know, even connecting uh, us with you, uh, uh, Prof. Jacobson, and allow us, you know, just to focus on those kind of details and sharing. So when you're talking about conferences and those kind of opportunities, which you started this session with is sometimes we find an opportunity, sometimes opportunity would find us, sometimes we create it, sometimes we just keep searching because we're still looking and having this sense of curiosity and sense of uh, seeking new knowledge and new ways. So, and that goes back to the first session Prof. Ira was referring to us that really we're researching to learn. It's not only about publishing or having a fixed structure or just um, assuming or generalizing that this is the end of the world. So by having this continuous kind of uh, learning and seeking and listening to learn, these kind of skills that we need to keep refreshing. And when we were talking about I know uh, Ibrahim had mentioned social media and sometimes some of the conferences would have apps to connect people or to start networking or providing different platforms, but it's more about that. So when I'm, I'm reading um, a study, I will be listing that I wish if I meet this person, I wish if I can go and search more, if I meet him or her, what am I going to prepare and what kind of things or concepts that we might be learning. And this is, I think, what we had Ibrahim and Exi and we were preparing, okay, this person is having this session, so let's go and let's try to ask those questions or to network or at least to explore more to see where are we heading from this. So it's it's more about the, the preparation from our side, and the, as you had mentioned, the willingness to start to collaborate and um, to dig deep. And as we're announcing that our next session by end of October would be also about international education, so this is a nice transition between uh, international partnership and then going back to redefine what is international education and what different forms and format that we will be discussing and highlighting. And with the examples that the audience are sharing within this uh, chart, the examples that they're having, we don't know everything. And there's lots of things happening in different countries and in different contexts and different levels of uh, of research, maybe at a school level or maybe at a conference or a, a big organization. But how we all start sharing and paying attention that this is really a way of partnering or a way of collaboration. If you like to conclude or to end up our session for today. Three of you. <laughs> I just want to thank you all for this great pleasure. This has been this has been very enjoyable. I like spending the morning with you guys. Ayla. And for me, you know, starting with Dr. El Amin from Lebanon and then going to Ann Lopez when she was in Zimbabwe, where she did her her Zoom, and now with Steve Jacobson. Um these these are learning opportunities. This is the privilege of being a professor, is, is the ability to be in places where there are exciting ideas being shared. Brian. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jacobson, for being with us. We learn a lot from you and uh, um, I hope this conversation will uh, will continue, and we are so excited to uh, see all of the audience on our next seminar, which will be on the 25th of October. We will announce for it uh, through our social media platforms, where the place that we can connect and reach each other during uh, this world. Thank you so much. Rania? Um, thank you, everyone. I know that lots of uh, chats and discussion, Noor had uh, shared lots of interesting resources. Thank you. And congratulations uh, on passing your master's degree, Tehani, also for uh, sharing those and all of the audience. Um, once again, it's despite of all the experiences we shared, it's how the you had addressed Dr. Jacobson and Dr. Bogic, the human aspect of how we add a value to what we are contributing and we provide those kind of opportunities for others. So with all the examples that you had shared, I am sure that maybe two people would be in the same committee or the same uh, session, but this would you know, like exceed expectations with networking and benefiting and networking and seeing lots of opportunities. And the other way would be just sitting and saying like, um, what are they doing? 
So it's it's more about our willingness, our being able to um, seek more of of those kind of um, let's say enlightenment and and different ways of learning instead of only being in a comfort zone and saying like as or even as Dr. Ira had started this conversation earlier, how we trust each other and how we start opening new dialogue and new conversations for new perspectives. I can't personally thank you enough. As always, this is an amazing um, learning experience and journey for everyone. And we also keen, as we always talk about those sessions that we're having, please share ideas, share uh, within different kinds of platforms or encourage others and let us know if we started uh, adding anything for whoever is joining us, and that would be even having such a discussion as a, an outcome and an amazing result by itself. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brahim, and um, both Brooke Bogart and Brooke um, Jacobson. Thank you, everyone.